Today marks the beginning of our December sermon series. Our theme is the light of the world, which is what Christ said of himself in John chapter 8, verse 12, when he said, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So what does it mean that he's the light of the world? And more specifically, how is that light revealed in his incarnation, in his being born? And secondly, how does this light penetrate into our darkness, into our daily lives, into our 2015 December 6th, right? Or 5th, I don't know. 6th. So today we're looking at the Messianic prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9, the first seven verses. Throughout this month, we're going to be looking at different passages in Scripture that speak of Jesus as the light. Sometimes it's going to be himself describing himself as the light of the world. Sometimes it's going to be his disciples speaking of him as the light. In this case... It is God through Isaiah the prophet promising the coming of the Messiah. Now, when we read Isaiah chapter 9, we need to read it with the understanding that this is a promise fulfilled in the birth of Christ. But also finds its fulfillment in our personal lives, having given those lives to Jesus Christ. And also has a third fulfillment that's going to be in the time to come. So that's something really interesting when we look at prophecy in Scripture. There is an initial fulfillment. And then there is often a secondary fulfillment. But if you guys would read with me in Isaiah chapter 9. I'm reading from the New King James Version. So it says this. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. And afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that unto us, unto us, a child is born. That Lord, unto us, a son is given. We are not worthy. We are not worthy. You have extended grace upon grace upon grace toward us. Lord, through the birth, death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have redeemed us. 
Lord, may we no longer live in darkness. May we live in the light. For you are the light. Be with us this day, Lord. Open our hearts. Open our ears. Help us to understand what it is that you are speaking to us in your word. Lord, that we may have hope. We may have peace. We may have confidence and faith in your promises. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Start with the first two verses. It says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed, this is God, he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the Gentiles. The first thing we need to understand is, since we are reading Isaiah, that the direct and first intended audience was the nation of Israel. It was the nation of Israel that this prophecy was spoken to. Right? So that's going to inform our interpretation of the text. We don't just go to this text and we don't just say, okay, this is about me personally and my own personal walk with Christ, although it can apply in that way. And we don't just go to the text and say, okay, this is about the New Testament church that started at Pentecost. This is about us, you know, the church today. We don't just do that because we understand that God spoke through the prophet to the nation of Israel. And the Messiah came to the nation of Israel, right? I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus is a Jew. He's not Anglo-Saxon. He's not blue-haired, or not blue-eyed, blonde-haired. Definitely not blue-haired. Boy, Jesus had a phase, you know, teenagers. Um, he's, he's not the pictures that we often see portraying Jesus. He, he's not like that, okay? And, and, and I know this might weird you out a little bit, but he probably looks more like the Muslim people that are being posted all over the news for blowing places up. He looks more like that. He's Middle Eastern. Okay? When that's understanding, we need to understand Jesus from an Israelite, Hebrew, Jewish context, and it's going to help us grasp how he is, what was promised, how he came through the nation of Israel. Um, and that's going to inform our interpretation of this text here. So the gloom we read about here. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed is a, is a gloom that carries over from the previous chapter of Isaiah where he warned Judah, the, the southern nation, right? The kingdom of Israel split into a northern and southern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. Israel was the northern kingdom. Israel, the northern kingdom, held 11 of, or excuse me, 10 of the Israelite tribes and the, north, and the southern kingdom, Judah, held Benjamin and Judah. That's all I had, okay? Um, he warned Judah, the southern kingdom, about the coming invasion of the nation of Assyria. And so Judah turned away from God. They followed after idols. They had evil kings. And so God, in his sovereignty, uses a pagan nation, the nation of Assyria, to place judgment on them. To teach them, to discipline them. And this is what uh, is said in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22. Oh, I guess I forgot to read that part. We'll get to that. It says this, then they, will walk, then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. This is about the coming nation of Assyria who's going to attack the promised land and drive them out. So in Isaiah 8.22, when the Assyrians invaded the promised land, the devastation was particularly bad for the northern tribes of the promised land. Which is why Zebulon and Naphtali are mentioned here. 
Because when Assyria entered into the promised land, they came from the north. And so they devastated the northern part of the kingdom very, very harshly. And when we understand this historical connection, it makes the promise of verse 1 even more precious. This is what it's saying. It's saying the northern regions of the promised land, like Zebulon and Naphtali, around the Sea of Galilee, had the worst of the Assyrian invasion. The promise is that this land, which was at one time lightly esteemed by God, God didn't think anything of it. It wasn't important. It wasn't of significance to him. And then heavily oppressed by God, by the Assyrian empire, the Assyrian invasion, is one day going to receive a special blessing from God. And you know what? We find this prophecy fulfilled in Jesus who spent much of his ministry where? In Jerusalem and Judea? No, where? Around the Sea of Galilee. In fact, the authors of the Gospels pulled this text into Matthew chapter 4. It says this, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the Sea of Galilee, in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's your fulfillment right there. Jesus left the area of Judea and Jerusalem because he, um, he was avoiding persecution because John had been, John the Baptist had been beheaded. And he knew that the religious leaders were out to get him and it wasn't his time yet. So he went up to Galilee where he would have more freedom to pursue his ministry. And what is this blessing? What is this blessing that these northern tribes, these northern uh, tribes of Israel... Zebulun and Naphtali around the Sea of Galilee, what are they going to receive? Well, verse 2 begins to tell us. It says, Then they will look, oh, that's not it. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Those who walked in darkness, and those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death. Okay, so when you read those things, what's the feeling that you get there? Those who walked in darkness. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death. The idea is that of a sense of insecurity, sorrow, despair, fear. When I read that shadow of death, I often think of the 23rd Psalm. Although I walk through the shadow of death. But in this instance, it stops there. Although I walk through the shadow of death. That's it. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. He's saying, you are in a great darkness. You are under much oppression. You are being persecuted. You are suffering. You're in despair. Gloom, darkness, shadow of death. There's a hopelessness that has taken captive the nation of Israel. In the time of Isaiah, as they are awaiting the imminent judgment of God through the Assyrian Empire, the Assyrian invasion. But if we see the fulfillment of this verse taking place in the time of Jesus' birth, which it does, that's exactly what's happening to the nation of Israel. God's chosen people are being oppressed under the thumb of Rome. 
with all kinds of abuses like high taxation. And on top of that, the religious leaders, their very own people, have become corrupt and have further oppressed the people by making the laws of God, the Mosaic law, more burdensome than it was ever intended to be. How would you feel if I told you that the only way you could be forgiven of your sins is if you came into a temple and displayed your offering in front of me and I said, you know what, this isn't good enough. It's got a blemish on it, but I'm going to keep that anyways for my feast later with my family. Go and fetch another thing for me. That's what the religious leaders were doing. They were manipulating the people, oppressing the people, burdening the people. It wasn't worship of God. It was worship of self. Using God as a manipulative tool to control people. Much like what we would think of as cults today. And the occult. All the while proclaiming at the top of their lungs how praiseworthy they were and how righteous they were. See, the people of God are heavy burdened at the time before Jesus' arrival. They are stuck in a deep religious sorrow, an insurmountable pain and suffering they are enduring at the hands of other nations and their very own religious leaders. And that is what makes this light so glorious. Because the darkness that precedes it is so great. The light, the light is the good news of the gospel which finds its fulfillment in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If darkness is what is offered to us from the world, light is what is offered to us From Jesus Christ. Have you ever been in a room where you turned on a light and the darkness overcame the light? It's impossible, right? Have you ever been somewhere so dark? That when you turn on your cell phone screen, it's like, the darker the darkness, the more bright the light. Light overcomes darkness. Therefore, joy also overcomes fear and insecurity. The darkness is overcome by the light. And so the gloom and the shadow of death is overcome by the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. I I do want to say though here in this moment that there is a light that this world offers. There is a light that this world offers. It pales in comparison to the light of Jesus Christ. If you put the two by each other, it'd be an easy choice, right? But there is a light that this world offers, and and I like to think of it kind of like the light of a bug lantern you put out on the deck. It's alluring, you know, it looks desirable. And you want to buzz over there and and see what that is. But it's a light that leads to death and eternal damnation. And if you follow the light of this world, it will end right into the... Right? Right? 
So when someone tells you to follow the light, make sure they're talking about Jesus. Because when you follow the light of the world, that light just keeps on going straight into eternity. And the wonderful thing about the light of the world is that no matter how long you look at it, you don't need sunglasses. And no matter how long you look at it, it doesn't hurt your eyes. No matter how long you look at it, it's never enough. But you're always fulfilled. The light of Christ is a pure and true light. That leads to a life of purpose and fulfillment. Because you're finally living for the reason you were created. To give glory to God, your creator. And that life ends in eternal life. So it doesn't end. (laughs) You see this building up that Isaiah is doing here. Of despair. In darkness, in our context, the world, if you're seeking joy and fulfillment in the world, so I feel sorry for you. It's a broken sister. Trying to, trying to take a drink out of a cup that has no bottom. It's trying to pay for things with a bank account that's already in the negative. And in Israel's case, they're trying to find freedom under the law. They were trying to please God by keeping the law, which was never the point of the law. The law was to show us our need of a Savior. The law was to show us that God's requirement for us is moral perfection and thought, word, and deed. And guess what? That's impossible. But instead, they took it and they twisted it. And they became self-righteous and prideful. And they they prided themselves on being the chosen nation of God where all the other nations weren't chosen because of how wonderful they were when God said, I did not choose you because of how great you were. I choose you because I chose to love you, plain and simple, despite your unworthiness. In both of those situations... Trying to find joy and fulfillment and light in this world for us and also for the nation of Israel finds its fulfillment in the coming of Christ and his salvation and his promise of restoration. Let's continue reading. Verses 3 through 5. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. So these verses go on to describe what's it going to be like when the Messiah comes. What's it going to be like when this promised Messiah arrives? And the overwhelming idea that I get is it's joy. It's joy. This joy finds its fulfillment in those who are redeemed by Christ today. And this joy finds its fulfillment in Israel for those who are awaiting the coming Messiah. What kind of joy? Joy like the harvest. And when I read this, you know, us being in a farming community, I kind of think, you know, 
Harvest isn't necessarily a time that we look forward to because people go out in the fields in the middle of the night and they work for like three weeks straight doing nothing but bringing grain in, bringing corn in. And, and you know, it's just exhausting. You're not getting any sleep. You know, I kind of see harvest described here as, as um, the joy of harvest when all of it's done. And the grain's in the barn and, and you realize you don't have to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning the next day. And the, the job is finished and, you know, you can take your boots off and whew, take a deep breath. That kind of joy, you know. The joy of harvest. When all the hard work has paid off and everything is finished and the barns are full. It's been a good year. You had a high yield. And joy like when men divide the spoils of battle. Okay, we don't go uh, battling anymore, but I imagine it like this. You know, um, joy like the celebration in a locker room after winning a basketball game or a football game. That kind of joy, you know? Yeah, we worked hard, we practiced, and we beat them. That kind of joy. Joy, as in the days... Of Gideon. That's what it's talking about here. Midian. Joy is in the days of Gideon. When they were enslaved. And in bondage to the nation of Midian. When God through his might took 300 men. I know you heard about the Spartan movie. 300. This is the original 300. Okay. It's Gideon. When God took 300 men. And broke the yoke of Midian by surrounding the army encampment and smashing battle, bottles on the ground. I, I mean, it's just awesome. You need to read that story. He broke the yoke of Midian. He broke the staff of Midian. He broke the rod of Midian. And he freed his people from their plight. That kind of joy. Where do we find Gideon at the beginning of that story? Hiding, threshing his wheat. Because he didn't want the Midianites to see him. Because if they saw him, they would come and they would take it away. And where do we find Gideon at the end of the battle? At the end of the story? Freedom. Oh, the joy. that They no longer have to live in fear. They no longer have to hide away. They no longer have to hide and escape in the caves. Oh, they've got freedom. Oh, what joy. As wonderfully complete, joyous, and victorious as Gideon's victory over Midian was, that's the same kind of victory the Messiah is going to enjoy and the Messiah is going to give. And unlike the victory over Midian, this victory is complete. Because you see, God came in and he, and he freed his people from, from their bondage from the Midianites, but what, what happened? Every person went to their own way and did what was right in their own mind. Now they were again in the same place over and over and over again. How do we know this victory is complete? Because it says every warrior's sandal from a noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. What does this mean? It means the battle's over. You don't need Nikes anymore because you're not playing basketball anymore. All right? You don't need warrior sandals. You take them off and you don't need that, that robe that you, that you wore, that the garments that you wore in battle that are covered in the blood of your enemies that are covered in your own blood. You take that stuff off and you have a bonfire. I wouldn't suggest you cooking s'mores over the blood-covered garments though. That's just me. Because there's no more need for battle. The battle is won. It's over. The Messiah's victory is final. The light has overcome the darkness. The light has overcome the darkness. I think that's some pretty good joy if I might say so myself. I hope you guys are experiencing living in that kind of joy. Let's continue on. It says, For unto us a child is born, 
Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. This prophecy of the birth of Christ should have explicitly told Israel that this victory bringing Messiah would be a man. Because what? He's going to be born. There's nothing more natural than that. Okay, the only way you can be a human is if you're born. <laughs> right? Anybody else have any other suggestions of other ways to become human? We've been trying for a while, but we still can't. That's the only way is to be born. There's nothing more weak, more helpless, and more completely dependent than a child. And the fact that our Messiah would humble himself, would humble himself to the point of crying because he wants his mama should be something that absolutely amazes and perplexes you and humbles you. In order for us to really grasp this, we need to understand that John chapter 1 talks about how in the beginning was the Word. And how all things are made through Him. And so when you turn to Genesis chapter 1, and it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. When you read that, you need to understand it as this in the beginning, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth. And so before the beginning of anything, God has existed in His triune nature, three distinct persons, one God, okay? I know that's, just get your mind around that. And Jesus, God the Son, is part of that. And we see God the Son coming out of eternity and time stamping himself in human nature when he's born on Christmas Day. And think about this. Why did Jesus have to come as a baby? He, he, Adam was a fully grown person when God made him. Boom. He's probably like, what, 25? That's a good age to start with. 25, boom. You know? Adam was made. Jesus came as a little wee baby. Because that's the only way he could have the whole realm of human experience. Because Jesus wouldn't be able to look at you in the eyes and say, I get it. I know. I understand. been there I've done that and I got the t-shirt that's what Jesus wanted to say that's what he wanted he humbled himself and became a child born of the Virgin Mary not only a child to us is born but a son is given the eternal Son of God, the second person of the God, had a perfect, infinite being to offer a perfect, infinite atonement for our sins. Okay, I know this is difficult to understand, but I'm going to try to help you grasp this. Because I think you, you need to understand this. A fully man, the child... And to us a child is born. Fully man. Fully God. 
unto us a son is given. Okay? That's why these two things are made a distinction here. Unto us a child is born, the, the, the human nature of God. Unto us a son is given, the divine nature of God in Jesus Christ. Okay? This is what is called the hypostatic union. I know it sounds really cool, doesn't it? I love saying that. The hypostatic union. And when I say that, I mean this. 100% man, 100% God, not 200%. 100% Jesus. Okay? And that is that God, when he became a man, did not give up his divine nature. He added the human nature to the divine nature. And that's the only way that he could make atonement for our sins. This truth is of utmost importance. Because if Jesus were not fully man. He couldn't stand in the place of sinful man. And be a substitute for the punishment man deserves. But if Jesus were not fully God. His sacrifice would be insufficient. If he's not fully God. And he's not fully man. We are still lost in our sin. This makes me think of uh, old St. Nick. St. Nicholas is actually a church father who was alive during the time of a heresy that dealt with this very issue. And a man named Arius started going around saying that Jesus wasn't God. And so they gathered the church fathers together and they had a discussion. And uh, St. Nicholas got so frustrated with this man, he got up and he punched him in the face. I'm dead serious. Look it up. I love that Santa Claus. He said, how dare you claim that Jesus isn't God? The three favorite doctrines of Satan. The Bible can't be trusted. Jesus isn't God. Hell isn't real. Anytime you ever see the world attacking the Christian faith, you watch out right there. That's Satan at work. Because if the Bible can't be trusted, then you can do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. You can make up whatever God you want, whatever Jesus you want. And if Jesus isn't God, why listen to him? Why read the Gospels? Why care about what he said? He was just a nice moral teacher. He was just a nice guy that lived a, a while ago and had these wonderful sayings about how we should live our lives. And, and if hell isn't real, my friends, you have no moral obligation to your life at all. You're not morally accountable to your creator. Watch out. Hypostatic union. 100% God, 100% man. The child is born, the son is given. And the government will rest upon his shoulder. And this uh, speaks about the coming rule of Christ on earth that he talks about in Matthew chapter 25 and that we also read about in Revelation chapter 20, often called the millennium. The thousand year reign of Christ, okay? I will just let you know, I take that literally. When I read that, I don't see any other reason not to understand that literally, okay? So if you want to go read Revelation 20 sometime, it talks about how Christ is going to come back, Revelation chapter 19, and then for a thousand years, he's going to reign on earth while Satan and his enemies are chained away. And then after that thousand years, they will escape. There will be one final battle of Armageddon. And then they will all be taken care of, cast into the hell, uh, the fire, lake of fire, uh, Hades, death, and all those who have not put their tr trust in Jesus Christ. And, and then all that will be dealt with. And then we'll have the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Okay? I don't see any other reason why not to read the book of Revelation that way. Blessed is the man who reads these words and understands them. That's what it says, okay? The millennium. 
The government will be upon his shoulder. So although this points to a future reality, we're called to seek God's will on earth as it is in heaven, right? That's what we're called to right now. And we as redeemed believers often reap some of the benefits of this government. I like to talk about this as the already but not yet, okay? And so when Jesus died on the cross and he was resurrected and he went up to sit at the right hand of God, this began the church age. This began uh, the, the last days that we live in right now where those who are his sheep, those who he has redeemed, experience some of the benefits of the future kingdom that is to come. We're already but not yet, if that makes sense, okay? Um, and so Gail Irwin has written a nice piece um, on the government God has promised in Christ that we are experiencing now as in a mirror. But we'll one day experience face to face, as Paul says. And he says this, What might such a government look like? First of all, it would look like it's king. Politicians of this day look for what they can get from you. Jesus looks for what he can do for you. Leaders of this day surround themselves with servants. Jesus surrounds us with his servanthood. Leaders of this day use their power to build their empire. Jesus uses his power to wash our feet and make us clean and comfortable. Leaders of this day trade their influence for money. God so loved that he gave his only son. Generals of this day need regular wars to keep their weapons and skills up to date and ensure their own advancement. Jesus brings peace and rest to hearts. The higher the plane of importance one reaches in this world, the more inaccessible he becomes. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Leaders of this day are desperate to be seen and heard. Jesus sought anonymity. So he could be useful. Obviously, Jesus is not in charge of the halls of Washington, London, Moscow, Baghdad, Paris, or Bonn. So how can we ever believe the government will be upon his shoulders? Actually, his government shows its working in wonderful ways. This is still him. So. Whenever I see someone who miraculously leaves a life of drugs or alcohol and is restored to his family and work, I can see that he is now governed by God. Whenever I see loving Christians gently caring for orphans and those rejected by family, I know I am watching people governed by God. Whenever I see people eagerly learning the Bible and joyously praising, I know who the governor is. Whenever I see people give up lucrative careers simply to go and share the good news of Jesus, I know they are governed by God. When I see pastors carefully teach and lead the flock God has given them, I know they are getting signals from the great king. When I see people People leave family to live and teach in distant lands because they love the people who have not heard. I know they are governed by God. So indeed, the government is alive and working, often silently, mostly unseen. We can be and are by choice governed by God. Hope and joy and peace and rest cover its subjects. Justice, mercy, and grace amazingly coexist. I like this kingdom. The borders are open. Come on in. Amen, right? What does it say? And his name. Now, does this mean this is Jesus' little name? No, it means his character, who he is, what he is like. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Does thinking of Christ fill you with wonder? I believe you can never really look at Jesus, never really know him, and be unmoved by him. He should fill our heart and our mind with amazement. Oh, this king, oh, this lowly king who came down and he, and he lived to die for us. Fill you with wonder. Always wonderful. He is our counselor. 
I'll let Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Peacher, Preachers, not Peachers, speak on how Jesus is the counselor. Christian, do you know what sweet counsel is? You have gone to your master in the day of trouble, and in the secret of your chamber you have poured out your heart before him. You have laid your case before him with all its difficulties, as Hezekiah did, Rabshakeh's letter. And you have felt that though Christ was not there in flesh and blood, yet he was there in spirit, and he counseled you. You felt that his was counsel that came from the very heart. But he was something better than that. There was such a sweetness coming with his counsel, such a radiance of love, such a fullness of fellowship that you said, oh, that I were in trouble every day if I might have such sweet counsel as this. Christ is the counselor whom I desire to consult every hour. And I would that I could sit in his secret chamber all day and all night long because to counsel with him is to have sweet counsel, hearty counsel, and wise counsel. Counsel, all at the same time. His counselor. The Messiah is mighty God. God of all creation, the Lord who reigns in heaven. Can there be a more straightforward declaration of the deity of Christ? This child who is born, this son who is given, his name is mighty God. Mighty God. This is connecting the Messiah Jesus with the Yahweh God because they are one and the same. One is Christ, He's everlasting Father. They are again and saying, the Son who is giving, given is the everlasting Father. It's a paradox in your mind, just let it be the mystery. That is there for us, okay? It is a mystery. A wonderful mystery. He's everlasting Father. This, this speaks about that, that Christ is the author and originator of all eternity. That Christ is the creator himself. As we talked about earlier. And he is the prince of peace. The one who makes peace between God and man. You see, we were separated from God because of our sin. Because we transgressed the law. We broke the law. In the Garden of Eden, Satan deceived Eve. Eat, ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. From that day, God has cursed us. We have inherited the curse of Adam. We are broken. We are depraved. We are sinful people. And God breaks through. To us. And bridges the gap. Between him and us. He brings peace between God and man. And ultimately in the time to come. He's going to bring peace to all. I see this reality described in Ephesians chapter 2. Where Paul says this. Starting at verse 14. He says... For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Paul's talking about the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles here. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. That's the Prince of Peace. Let me just take this moment to assure you. If you're looking for a religion of peace... It is Christ. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. 
If someone says, carry my bag for a mile, carry it two miles. Love them when they hate you. Pray for them when they persecute you. Do nice things for them when they are rude to you. Encourage them when they mock you. That is our God. The Prince of Peace. You will not find that anywhere else. You will not. There will be no end. I'm going to go back to the verse. Of the Messiah. His government and peace, there will be no end. He will rule for all eternity. We see a description of this in Revelation. In the city of New Jerusalem, it says the Lord and the Lamb will be its light. And then those who are in the book of life will worship and serve them for all eternity. Upon the throne of David. And this here is a reference to the Davidic covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In verse 16 he said this. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. We are reading here a promise of the fulfillment of that covenant with David. To those who have repented of their sin and surrendered their lives to the Lordship of Christ... We experience these aspects of his personality now. We experience these now. He's wonderful. He is counselor. He is mighty God. He is everlasting father. He is prince of peace. But in the future, these offices will be imposed upon the world in a complete and total sense. And that is that at every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is the peace that he will bring. Okay? And if there's any peace in Islam, I'm just going to put it out there. That is the peace that they're talking about. They say there is no peace until every knee bows to Allah and Muhammad is prophet. There is no peace until every infidel's head is chopped off and everyone lives under Sharia law. That's the peace that they're talking about. But they're trying to get it in this life. Following a false prophet and a false God. Jesus Christ has promised that that peace will come. But it's not in this life. It's in the life to come. And the lion will lay down with the lamb. And all the world will be at peace. And you will turn on your news station and there won't be anything there because there will be no news station because we don't have to hear about any more massacres, any more shootings, any more nothing because Jesus Christ is Lord and all who live in that place serve Him alone and they are His. He will be our God and we will be His people. I guess ultimately that's the rest that I look toward. So what does this mean to us today? How has this light of the world shown himself to us today in this passage? What I want you to grasp. And I pray that you get this. Is that this was a promise given by God through Isaiah the prophet. 700 years prior to the birth of Christ in a manger. In the little town of Bethlehem. And. From our perspective. We know. This is a promise. That God fulfilled. On that very first. Christmas night. When unto us. A child. Was born unto us. A son. Was given. And what should that mean for us? That means we can have confidence. We can have the utmost assurance that God keeps His promises. Including 
those we read today. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen? Amen. Are you in darkness? Come see the light of the world. Are you in a time of gloom? Come experience the joy of your Savior. Do you feel you are in a battle? The war has been won. Do you feel enslaved and in bondage? Let Christ break the yoke of your burden. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Do you feel there is no hope in this present life and in this present time and in this country with these leaders and all the sad evidence of depravity and brokenness that we are seeing right now? Do not be afraid for the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. This is a hope above all hopes. We can cling to these with complete trust and confidence because we have seen God fulfill these promises in the first Christmas. We are presently seeing God fulfill these promises come true in our own lives and in the church and in all believers. And we will see the perfection and completion of this in the age to come, the new heaven, the new earth. And when I say this, you can hold on to this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, the zeal of the God of angel armies will do this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our salvation. It is the anchor of our hope, Lord, that you have promised and you have kept those promises. We thank you now as we begin our journey to Christmas morning. That unto us a child was born and unto us a son was given. Undeserving, Lord, grace upon grace upon grace. You have bestowed upon us a people unworthy. A people of unclean lips, as Isaiah said. Lord, may we honor you. May we serve you. May we live with that confidence, knowing that you will keep those promises. Lord, may we cling to your promises with the utmost assurance that you, the Lord of hosts, will perform these. Lord, that we can have hope, that we can have faith, we can have assurance that these times will pass. That those who are in great darkness have seen a wonderful light. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And may we lift that light high. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.